Good afternoon, and welcome to the 29th Annual Showcase, which is our first virtual event. I am Tony O'Donnell, a partner at Moss Adams and a board member of the Sacramento Entrepreneurial Academy. We are excited to be celebrating our fellows' progress through the 2020 Academy, in which they were able to overcome significant disruption and obstacles. They truly demonstrated an entrepreneurial spirit at the highest level. I want to start by thanking our sponsors. We would not be able to have a consistently successful Academy without their generous donations, let alone this celebration event. Our leadership circle sponsors are Jim Corbett, the founder of the Academy, and Ben Stern, a past fellow, Bay Equity, which was founded by Brett McGovern, a, a past fellow, Ethan Conrad Properties, founded by Ethan Conrad, a past fellow, and Buzz and Sherry Stryker, with Buzz Stryker also being a past fellow. Thank you. Our hosting sponsors are Five Star Bank, Moss Adams, and Weintraub Tobin. I cannot thank this group enough, along with our showcase committee, for the significant effort that they undertook to put on this event today. Thank you to our board members on the showcase committee, Chris Chediak, Corley Phillips, and Anthony Garcia, and Christy Serrato, our program director and a past fellow, our president, Lori Dakin, also a past fellow, Darlene Babcock with Moss Adams, and especially Mary Seisloff with Weintraub Tobin. Our speaker sponsors are Carolyn and Buddy Hubbard, with Buddy being a former board member, longtime sponsors Smud and Monetta Ventures, and Notify, co-founded by Ann Tran and Sita Siphon, both past fellows. Our event today includes our keynote speaker, Dustin Devan, a past fellow, sharing his entrepreneurial journey, and we'll include time for questions and answers. That'll be followed by remarks from our president, Lori Dakin. We'll also have elevator pitches from our most recent fellows, John Goldberg, Jessica Doust, and Brianna Mason. We're also having a spotlight on where they are now with Ryan Seipkins, a 2017 fellow, and his business, Touch Shooting. We'll wrap up the event with networking sessions with the fellows that will be conducted in Zoom breakout rooms in which you can go into and out of for the last 30 to 40 minutes. I also want to congratulate our fellows who were not able to attend today's event. We wish you could be here. We will start with a quick hosting sponsor message by me on behalf of Moss Adams. Moss Adams has been proud to support the Sacramento Entrepreneurship Academy and its annual showcase for more than 10 years. And we're excited to be sponsoring the showcase once again. As we all remain resilient through different periods of disruption, we're helping companies navigate change the way we always do. Bringing our West mindset to business through innovative solutions and strategic collaboration. We share this entrepreneurial ethos and forward-looking mindset with the SEA and its fellows. And when it comes to lending support to entrepreneurs like you, more than ever, we're all in. On behalf of the entire Moss Adams team, thank you for tuning in today. Now I'll turn it over to Jim Corbett to introduce our keynote speaker, Dustin Devan. Hello, Academy family. I'm Jim Corbett, and I'm very proud to tell you that I'm the founder of the Sacramento Entrepreneurship Academy. In the same breath, I can tell you that along the way, I've had innumerable people help me both start the Academy and maintain it for several years. And since I've kind of stepped away from the Academy, I'm so proud to tell you that the uh, leadership of the Academy has carried forth this tremendous uh, idea and concept of ours and continues to work with phenomenal young people on the road to entrepreneurship. It is my special honor today to introduce to you Dustin Devan, our speaker. Dustin was a 2004 Academy uh, alum, uh, Academy graduate, and he subsequently, uh, after his degree at UC Davis, he, in both mechanical and aeronautical engineering, he took a job in the construction industry in Sacramento. Over six years, he worked for two large general contracting firms, and as a result of this experience, he went about putting together a platform for large general contractors to bid their jobs. 
uh, when he uh, when he put the idea on paper, worked with a, a very fine lawyer in the Sacramento region, he came to me and asked me if I would be an investor. And uh, I was I was uh, I was very happy to make an investment. Uh, uh, over the years, a number of academy people have come to me, and, and I've done so as well. With Dustin, I, I enjoyed observing him in the academy class, and at graduation, I'll never forget this. I met him and I met met his mother there. Now, because of the nature of a lot of our uh, fellows, uh, oftentimes um, family members do not come to the graduations. They're they're oftentimes out of out of town students and what have you. But Dustin's mom was there from Vacaville. And it was evident to me that he had a very special relationship with his mother. Um, I just made note of that. So six years later, he comes to our house and we sit at the dining room table and he explains his idea to me. And since I've been, had tremendous experience in the, in the real estate industry, I understood it, appreciated it, and saw it as a viable business plan idea. He raised about a quarter million dollars from family and friends and uh, worked with uh, Latvia uh, IT developers to bring his platform to the business community. That was rocky, to be honest with you, but he persevered. But he knew he had to raise large amounts of money to, to put this platform up, get it running, secure uh, both general contractors as customers and subcontractors to come to the t come to the platform to enable themselves to bid on large jobs. So he went about trying to raise money in the venture capital world in the Bay Area, and what he did basically is hang out in coffee shops and attempt to meet a venture capitalists. I know he told me he spent some sometimes all days in these uh, coffee shops in Palo Alto. Long and short of it is he networked his way around the, the business community and raised three or four rounds of venture money, about $53 million. To my knowledge, he's the only Academy alum that's done this. No, a number of them have raised family and friends money to start their businesses. But this was the one, this is the one uh, alum that I know has raised venture money. Long and short of it is, He ended up uh, building uh, an 11, $11 million annual recurring revenue and eventually sold to a NASDAQ company out of the North Bay called uh, Autodesk. I'm not going to give you any more of the story other than I'm so proud of what Dustin's done. He gave seven years of his life to this. He ended up selling it to Autodesk for $275 million. His life has, uh, has not only changed for himself and his family, but more importantly, he's brought a lot of people along the way uh, with this successful venture. I'm proud to tell you he's my friend. We've talked about deals together. We talk about investing together. Uh, I've gotten to know his mom, uh, a number of his friends. Um, he's a special person to me. Um, I think you're gonna enjoy this talk. He will take questions at the end. As a quick reminder, when Mark Cuban came to the Academy 10, 12 years ago, he didn't do a prepared speech, he just took questions. So I really would urge you to get your questions ready for Dustin. I think you'll enjoy this conversation with him. Uh, with, without further ado, I give you Dustin Devan, 2004 Sacramento Entrepreneurship Academy alum. Thank you, Jim. Um, it's it's actually a really big honor for me to be here and for Jim Corbett to be doing the introductions. For people who don't know Jim well, I think he is one of the most kind-hearted individuals I've ever met. Um, he loves helping young professionals find themselves in the business world. And I think that level of giving back is something that we need more of in today's society. Now, Jim mentioned Mark Cuban. Mark Cuban actually presented at my class uh, um, 
showcase and to be able to uh, be the keynote, um, just like Mark Cuban one was, was a huge honor. So as I tell my story, you know, a lot of people have asked me to write it down. Um, some people find it valuable or inspiring. I know that some of the stuff I went through was a key component in people accepting offers to join Building Connected. Um, but I just hope it shows that, uh, you know, if you really want something, that you can go ahead and make it happen. And it doesn't matter where you come from or who you know, but you can persevere through almost anything. So with that being said, uh, I guess my story really begins with me graduating college. And I took a jump, uh, I, as Jim mentioned, I graduated with a degree in mechanical engineering and a degree in aeronautical engineering. Uh, but I didn't have a clue of what I wanted to do with my life. I knew I didn't want to be a hardcore engineer. Um, so I took a job with a company called Bechtel. Um, remember that name because it comes into play later in the story. Bechtel is a massively large privately a private company uh, that builds huge projects. Um, they built the Hoover Dam, so they've been around a long time. Um, and I went to work for them as a scheduling engineer. And so I started learning about scheduling massive projects. My first project was a $700 million coal-fired power plant in Sandell, Texas. Um, and that got my feet in the door in construction. Now, uh, Bechtel was great. Unfortunately, Bechtel uh, wanted to move me to Libya. And um, I did not want to go to Libya. And thank God, because people that went to Libya got evacuated and had some real issues when we bombed Gaddafi in 2012. So um, instead of moving to Libya, I, uh, I took a job with a company in Sacramento called Rudolph & Slutton. They're uh, a very large builder here in, in Roseville and up and down California. And I worked for them for the next four years learning general contracting. So my first, uh, my first major project with STEM was uh, an $80 million hospital in Kaiser, uh, for Kaiser in Roseville. Many of you have probably been to it. So I helped build the MOB2 on that campus. Uh, with Rudolph and Sludden, I was actually sent out to Las Vegas for two years to help with the construction of City Center. So that's Aria, Vidara, Veer, uh, Cosmo was actually, we were doing that, but that was another project. So that, that whole area we were building simultaneously. Um, I worked on that. I managed the Frank Sinatra parking garage. That was a $165 million parking garage. It's one of the largest in North America. Um, after that project, I came back to Sacramento. Um, I helped work on, um, on a UC Davis Medical Center project. Uh, we were expanding the cancer center. Um, ultimately, when the downturn in the economy hit, we, I was sent to Palo Alto. And, um, and while at Palo Alto, I was working on, um, HP's headquarter expansion and my old superintendent called me and he said, Hey, come to work for another company called Excel construction. A lot of RNS employees had gone there. So I jumped ship and I did, uh, my first clean room. So I did a class 10 clean room expansion for Western digital. That was a very, uh, uh very, uh, difficult project. Uh, the contract for it was a hard bid. Um, uh, but when you're doing. Uh, a clean room expansion and keeping something operational. It's very difficult to do in that with that sort of like contract restriction. Um, so that was fun. But while living in Palo Alto, you can't help but start learning about technologies and all the options out there to create businesses and transform industries. So while I was living in Palo Alto, I was renting a room uh, from this um, older lady, she rented out part of her house because uh, she just wanted the extra income. So there's like six of us living there. Um, but I started reading TechCrunch every day. Now, I grew up in Vacaville. Um, my mom's a real estate agent. My dad uh, uh, drove a train for Union Pacific Railroad for 33 years. And his father drove a train and his father drove a train. Um, so I didn't get a lot of exposure to what it means to build a startup and how there's venture capital and all, there's fin all these financial institutions available. Uh, to help you grow your business. But when you're down in the Mecca and P Palo Alto, you can't help but get um, get involved because everyone you meet is affiliated with tech in some way, somehow. So I started reading about this and then I started extrapolating, okay, um, what can I apply that I've learned in my life, apply to technology to make my industry better? Because it's what I knew the most. 
And I started looking at the software we currently used. Um, I started thinking about how the industry operates and I started making parallels to some things I was seeing in life. And specifically in commercial construction, in order to properly do business, a general contractor needs to maintain a contact database of thousands and thousands of people for all the various trades they could hire for. So whether that's an electrician, well, they could know 50 electricians and they need to know the people within there and they need to have the license information. So that's a lot of information to keep up to date. If you were to take some of the companies I work for, uh, just in California, they'd, they'd keep up to date about 50,000 individual contacts in their static database. Um, over time, uh, just like your phone book um, in your iPhone, you know, data degrades. People move, they change numbers, companies go in and out of business, new companies come up. So you're constantly keeping this information up to date, which is really time consuming. Um, and if that information becomes outdated, it can slow down your capacity to communicate with your vendors, to be responsive to your owner, to ultimately win work. Um, and I started thinking about how much I had moved around in my personal life. I had moved from Davis to Sacramento to uh, Maryland, back from Maryland to Sacramento to Las Vegas, Vegas to Sacramento, Sacramento to Palo Alto. But I didn't have any trouble keeping my, my social network uh, intact that was operating through Facebook and then I didn't have any problems. LinkedIn was becoming very popular and I had a profile in there so I could reach out to anyone. And I thought, how do we make, because construction, you need very specific information in order to properly communicate. Um, you might have an electrician's license, but you know, what's your bonding capacity? So what project limitations might I invite you to? Um, what types of projects might I invite you to? What types of projects might I not include you on? So uh, the concept was um, you could improve the industry if everyone's willing to get on one network in order to facilitate communication about upcoming work that should actually create a more efficient marketplace for buying projects. And uh, you know that all, that all sounds good in theory. Um, and there's, there's examples of it. There's built, like a physical example is in the old days, there used to be builders exchanges. And those still exist, but how do you virtualize that? And um, I think that that was uh, something that I did particularly well with Building Connected as I came up with, with a strategy to populate the network to actually go from zero to one. And that was, all right, why, why don't you leverage the fact that people, people in construction currently bought this bid management services to send documents to, and invite people to bid on projects? Well, why don't you give that service away for free? And then every person you invite has to create a profile and join a network. So that was the thesis of what Building Connected would become. We'd become the network for all of commercial construction and we'd onboard everyone by providing free communication. Um, how we make money down the road was to build premium features. And then ultimately, you know, we leverage the data to build marketplaces, advertising, procurement sort of revenues. So great, I had an idea. This is 2012. Uh, this is actually 2011. Um, I started thinking, well, I don't code. Well, I code, but it's like pathetic how I code. So I couldn't build it myself. And Jim's right. I started researching and, you know, I met these kind of shady people because I was posting ads on Craigslist and I got connected with a team of Latvian engineers. Um, and I, I made one of the biggest mistakes you can make as an entrepreneur and trying to build a technology company. I decided to outsource the development to this consulting team and I agreed to pay them $260,000 to build me the first version of Building Connected. Now I was uh, 29 years old. Uh, I did not have $260,000. I, you know, a year ago I was living in Las Vegas for the previous two years. Uh, 27, 28 year olds don't save money living in Las Vegas. So um, the first thing I did was um, once I got the quote is I called a friend and he agreed to put in 50,000, which was going to cover the first month's payment for building connected. The next thing I did was I quit my job because I knew the only way I was going to make the installment payments was if I was able to go into full-time fundraising mode and find people to finance this project. Um, I don't necessarily recommend what I did because I jumped all in and 
Uh, luckily, I had very little expenses. I didn't have a family, so no wife, no kid to support. Um, so I could live very cheaply, but um, it was still a rather large risk. Um, luckily, I was able to start getting family and friends to come in. And um, Jim came in around towards the end of that time. Um, and then the the most unfortunate thing happened about three months into the development i could see that the product wasn't going to be good enough and so um i was in a real bind because i had agreed based upon plans that we had drawn up and contracts that this is what the product's going to be and so at that point in time i learned something very valuable about product development you're never going to get it right the first time so uh, that's one of the reasons, one of the drawbacks of hiring a contract, uh, a team of contracted engineers is in when you have a change, well, there's costs associated with it. And so I decided to go with it and, and pay for um, completion of what I was going to call a prototype. And during that time, I raised um, about... 260,000, I'm sorry, the, the fees for it were 240,000, I raised 260,000. So I was gonna have a little bit left over uh, to try to do something afterwards. And um, sure enough, when, when they finished the prototype, I couldn't get a single general contractor uh, to use the product to invite people to bid. And I made one of the most fatal flaws you can make when you're trying to build a software company. I try to focus on everything that wasn't the MVP. So when I say the MVP, it's the most viable product. Um, the core thesis of Building Connected was if you had a project, could you easily invite people that you wanted to bid on them and they would build a profile for themselves and their business. And instead I built all these things around what you would do once you had a profile and create this really bad bidding experience for people with projects, they would rather pay for other software than use mine for free. So I, uh, I really did not succeed in what I was trying to do. Now, towards the end of 2012, um, you yeah, that's where things got tough. I'd paid all the contractors. I couldn't get anyone to use the project, uh, the product. And, um, I had moved to San Francisco during that development because that's where most of the companies and most of the activity was happening. Uh, but I had to go home during Christmas um, at the end of that year. And I honestly didn't know how I was gonna finance the building or the company. Um, I maybe had five grand left in my bank account. Um, I really didn't have like potential investors in mind. And uh, you know, my mom said, why don't, why don't you quit? And she said it much more nicely than that, but she said, why don't you go back to work? And I said, no, I'm not gonna do that. Um, so I decided to buckle down and going into 2013, um, I reached out to a friend who introduced me to someone else that I went to college with, who was a, an engineer and we started talking. Um, I showed him the thesis. I talked to him about what we needed to do, what we need to build, the vision of doing this. And I recruited a CTO and a co-founder. And it was the greatest thing, the greatest decision I've ever made in my life. Uh, my co-founder, Jesse Peterson, is amazing. He's one of the best humans I've ever met, which is essential when you're finding a co-founder because that co-founder is really I, for the last eight years, I was closer to Jesse than any other person in the world except for his wife. Uh, we spent so much time together. So making sure that you are compatible with your co-founder is vitally important. So Jesse and I talked and he's like, how much money do you have? And I said, I don't have really anything. He's like, well, I, I have enough personally to cover me and my family for the next 12 months. I said, okay. So uh, February, I decided to, February of 2013, I sold my car. I called my old boss, actually, who was interested in the idea, but wanted to see proof points. And I convinced him to give me a $10,000 personal loan. Um, he was like, well, you know, you can always get a job with me if this doesn't work. You can just pay me back. But, you know, just go for it, um, which to this day, I really appreciate what he did because Building Connected would not have taken place if it wasn't for him. So... 
Jesse and I, um, we really, we really were in love with the idea of Silicon Valley, where two founders get together and they raise venture capital on an idea, and uh, that does take place. And through the course of everything I had done, I had started meeting a lot of venture capitalists because, as Jim talked about, I hung out in coffee shops a lot. And when he means when he said a lot, I was in a coffee shop every day, and a part of um, not just working on the company and trying to find early ad early adopters. I would I had a deck built explaining what the business was, and I practiced pitching almost every single person in the coffee shop. I thought looked like they remotely could be an investor. So I'd probably pitched a thousand people at that point, and actually I'd developed a good network. So when Jesse came on board, you know we put together a deck and we got all these meetings, and we probably pitched twenty or thirty seed investors, and every single one of them one of them turned us down um you know we didn't have the resume to raise money without a product there were people doing it those people came from google apple facebook and they probably went to stanford uh we were not those individuals i managed construction and jesse uh was not a classically trained engineer so we said to hell with it um we met a few other angel investors. We raised an additional two hundred forty thousand in convertible debt, and Jesse said, "Screw it! I'm going to build it myself. You tell me what it needs to do. You tell me how it needs to work. You approve the wireframes." And so we hunkered down, and in six months, Jesse built a product that was so much better than I had had a team of engineers build that instantly we were able to get companies to start using it. And I remember in October of 2013, we had our first general contractor use us on a project. And it was like, um, it was the coolest thing in the world because we had we had analytics up of what was going on and you could see invitations being sent. You could see when people were clicking on it. You could see when new accounts were created and you could actually see the entire thesis working and evolving. And I, uh, I mean, I probably cried a little bit. Uh, we probably drank too much that day, uh, but it was super cool to see like something you had predicted would happen actually happen. Um, I mean, that was just the beginning of the journey, but really that one day is, uh, probably the most important day of the company's history. Um, from that point, Jesse and I knew we need to raise capital. Um, the, the problem with building connect is we're giving away free software. So we're not going to have revenue for the foreseeable future. And when you're not going to have revenue, you have to still pay your employees. So you need to raise capital in order to do so. Now, um, I was always looking to meet new investors and what I had done um, once uh, we got um, the GC to bid out work is I wrote investors saying, actually I did it before that. I wrote investors saying, hey, here's our thesis. Here's what we're gonna do. Once we have some data points about the success, will you take a meeting with me? And uh, I had a lot of venture capitalists write back saying, that's probably the best outreach approach we've ever heard. Usually people don't know me and say and ask for a meeting right away, but you just told me what you're going to do, and now you set the bar. So if you can go out and achieve it, I will gladly take the meeting with you. So coming out of 2013, Jesse and I, um, we wanted to hire someone. Jesse writing thousands and thousands of lines of code by himself was challenging. Um, we needed to grow. We needed to target new markets. We had maybe 10 general contractors in San Francisco using us. And um, so we put together a presentation. And luckily at that point in time, we were much more polished. We had data to prove the thesis was working. People were onboarding. More than 3,000 profiles were created. Uh, and um, yeah, we approached some seed, some institutional seed uh, uh, venture funds. Um, we were able to raise uh, $2.2 million seed round. Uh, seed round sizes have changed, but at that point in 2014, that was a, that was a pretty big deal. Um, we raised it from a company called Homebrew and a company called Freestyle. They were the leads. Um, as part of that financing, we also added some uh, strategic angel investors. And one of those angel investors is a gentleman named Darren Bechtel. Now, that last name should sound familiar. 
because Bechtel is the largest construction company. They're who I first had a job with. Uh, Darren's brother is the CEO, and he was doing investing, and he decided to come in the round. In fact, we reopened the round just so he could come in, and uh, uh, Darren joined the company. And uh, Darren also did something for me at the time that I'll, I'll, I'll uh, never be able to thank him enough for. Uh, so I had never paid myself the entire time. And uh, the money from selling the car, I don't know how I extended it so far, but uh, I really couldn't pay for rent with the salaries we were going to give us. So Darren um, arranged for me to take over managing uh, a dorm um, of about 60 foreign exchange students. And so my job on nights and weekends was to make sure everything worked in the kitchen and everything was clean. And then on the weekends, I'd have to check people in, make sure they weren't out past curfew. And But I got free rent, so I could live in San Francisco and I can work on Building Connected. Um, we had raised uh, that round with no capital, um, just on the idea, hey, we're gonna build this into a Series A finance company. For people that don't understand the, the term seed A, B, it's just the sequential order that you raise capital, nothing more than that. Um, and um, our pitch to, to the seed round investors were, we're still not gonna focus around on revenue. That'll be uh, past uh, series A. What we're gonna do is prove that the market, that this isn't just viable in San Francisco, we're gonna go to new markets and, and uh, operate it that way. So in order to do so, I had to hire more people. So Jesse started hiring engineers. I started hiring, I heard my first non, uh, a uh, non-engineering hire, a gentleman named Nate. And Nate now, and this is where you start seeing, you know, this viral spread of, Jim Corbett always says, entrepreneurs replicate themselves. And so I'm proud to say Nate, our first non-engineering hire, actually just signed his first seed round deal. So he was able to uh, close on uh, 1.5 million from a venture capital fund. And uh, I'm happy for him. Um, we were able to prove that we could go to new markets. And so just a year later, we raised um, our Series A from Crosslink Capital. Uh, that was a, a round of 8.5 million. And uh, we, uh, yeah, so in total, we had raised 10.7 between our seed, the debt, and then the, the A. And um, that was when we really wanted to accelerate growth. And uh, one of the things we did that was most effective and i highly encourage whenever you have a business that you're trying to grow is align everyone in the organization on one or two or at most three top line goals and this allowed us to rally to all be laser focused on this is what's important to achieve so for building connected we created um, a milestone and this milestone was actually two years out, well, 18 months out, uh, no, yeah, 18 months out. So we raised, we closed the round in, um, no, 21 months out. We closed the round in March of, of 2015. And we said by the end of 2016, we'll have a thousand general contractors using our bid management service. And that was a bold move. We projected if we did that, there'd be, you know, more than 100,000 businesses that had come through our system to bid on work. There'll be billions of dollars flowing through the surface. We thought we could raise capital even without revenue. And so we aligned everything we did to onboarding new general contractors, solving their problems, making them effective at communicating with their subs, and growing that network by going market to market. Um, and we were good at it. I mean, we were really, really good at it. We set that goal, which is amazing still to this day, 21 months early. And I'll have you know, at the, at the end of 2016, uh, we had 1,056 GCs. And I think that shows just how effective an organization can be when everyone knows what's really important. Um, in order to be that effective, um, you have to hire amazing people. Um, luckily. Um, we were able to find a product manager that um, I actually went to elementary school with. I ran into him uh, on the street 
He said, what are you doing? I said, I got a startup now. And he said, well, I'm really bored because I do ad tech and ad tech's really boring. I said, that, that makes sense. And so he started volunteering to work with us. And so Zach ultimately joined and he became, you know, if we, he wasn't a co-founder, but he became like Jesse and I's confidant in everything. And um, Zach's doing very well now. He's heading up part of product at Autodesk. Um, so we grew and we grew. And then the end of 2015, 2016, the market really turned in venture capital coming into 2016. And it was weird. Thing, people started freaking out. They thought there was the next, um, we had had a lot of good years and people thought that the market was going to turn on a dime. So, uh, you know, we started trying to raise money and um, we got a term sheet. And the term sheet, because the markets were all funky, was actually going to be a flat round. So it was going to be very dilutive to our team. And this is, uh, this is when um, you really get challenged as a founder. So Jesse and I, out of fear, actually signed a term sheet. And we did something that you're really not supposed to do in Silicon Valley because we ultimately decided that wasn't for us. We backed out of the term sheet. Um, that really, it made an enemy out of someone that I, I feel bad about, but um, that ended up being the right deal. Uh, the reason why it was the right deal was we had done everything we thought was pros was the proper thing, and um, we thought that you know someone would see the the value of what we were doing. So we thought we needed a little more time because revenue was starting to turn over, and um, we just need a little more runway. So I convinced uh, Darren actually to uh, lead an extension of our A and uh, for much less dilution and we were able to finance the business. While we were doing this, I was actually sued. I was sued both personally and the business for a variety of things. I was sued for IP, for defamation. I don't know, the list was like seven or eight things in, in some weird part of Texas. And uh, yeah, I was led by a, a competitor. And um, I'll tell you, you can sue people for anything. And to be honest, it was a very smart business decision by that individual. Although I think it moral, morally and ethically, it was a ter it, it it was a terrible thing that that individual did. Uh, so that uh, that became a very trying period for us. Um, lawsuits are stressful. You spend a ton of money on them. You never recoup the cost. It doesn't matter if everything is completely as this case was uh, uh, made up, uh, you have to defend yourself. So we did. We got through that. We cut costs. We started working and focusing on revenue. And ultimately, things started to really happen. So um, to understand our revenue inflection, um, we grew from 2016 to 2017 from 170000 to 376000 uh, in revenue from 2017 to 2018, uh, we grew from 300 and or from three 376 to 760. We grew the following year to 3.2 million, and then when we were acquired. We grew to 10.6 million. Uh, now, post Autodesk, we're over 25 million in reoccurring revenue. Once the revenue points, uh, once the revenue started clicking, we were able to raise our next round of capital. That was the largest round to date. We raised 22 million in venture capital led by Lightspeed, which is probably one of the most prominent VC funds in Silicon Valley. They were behind Snapchat and a host of other very successful companies. So that really put us at the forefront. Uh, we were able to grow the team. We got an office space. We, I, we did all the classic Silicon Valley things. We had trips. We had a pool table. We had games. We um, had a lot of fun. It, honestly, running your own company and when you're when things are good is the greatest thing in the world. Um, things are going so well. We even bought a company. So we bought a, another construction tool. Um, I'm trying to accelerate this. Uh, the the lesson learned from buying companies is you can buy. You can buy things and you can do creative financing. Um, and so you can structure things to make a lot of things that you would have thought impossible possible. 
Uh, we did one more round. We raised 15 million in debt financing by uh, Brookfield, which is one of the largest real estate asset companies in, in the world. Uh, they had opened up their venture fund, and so they put some money in. Ultimately, uh, we started getting approached to sell. And one of Autodesk competitors reached out to us first. And, um, it was a very attractive offer. And I, I, being the smart person I think I am, I made sure that Corp Dev at Autodesk also knew that we were being pursued because that was their competitor. And, uh, um, you know, we reached, we reached an agreement pretty quickly. Um, the other company was offering stock, which if you understand how stock works and a company that isn't public needs to go public, that creates a lot of uh, issues because none of it's liquid. Uh, Autodesk offer $275 million and $40 million in stock. So it was much more liquid offer. There was going to be very little contingencies. Um, or we had the offer to uh, continue uh, going at the company on, on our own. We actually had an offer for an additional round of financing. So uh, um, a venture fund out of the UK that's actually ran by Al Gore wanted to put in 40 million at 180 million pre. Um, and we thought about all the dilution. We also thought there was also some other things. Throughout that time, I started developing some health issues. Um, I actually developed AFib, had to be operated not operated on. I had to have my heart start stopped and started. Um, when I say Jim's a good person, he actually he's an amazing person. He actually came to see me when I had that procedure done. Um, eight years of building a business. There's a lot of highs and a lot of lows. Um, it's extremely stressful, uh, and so we thought that the best outcome to that would materially change our lives forever was to. Um, go through the transaction with Autodesk. Um, we thought that that was the best fit. P employees, everyone was going to end up realizing real material gains in themselves. We we, uh, we had eight people become millionaires because of the transaction. Um, just yesterday, I was talking to my head of marketing, and he thanked me again for changing his life because he just bought a $3 million house. And, and I don't know if uh, you can ever have a better feeling than uh, when people thank you for their houses or their lives or how special it was. Um, today, I'm vice president of strategy for Autodesk, uh, which is um, a title that doesn't have a lot of definition. Uh, still figuring out my place there, to be honest. I will say, um, I don't think this is going to be a surprise. I think once you've ran your own business, living in a large corporation where you have a boss and um, there's uh, limitations on your flexibility is not, <laughs> is not ideal. Um, I love the startup community. I love building things and creating things from nothing. I've done numerous angel investments now. I think that... Um, I think that people today put too many limitations on what you can do. They don't stop to think if they, if they could do it. Like there is so much you can accomplish and there are so many people who want to find the next best entrepreneur. If you just get out there and put yourself out there and go at it every single day, I think more people would be successful than, than are. Um, I'm so glad I quit my job. I, the experiences I had with building connected, um, I will remember for the rest of my life and uh, built deep friendships there. Um, and it's something I'll always cherish. I really hope that if, even if you don't start your own company, every person gets to experience what it's like to work for a company where, you know, everyone cares about you and everyone is fully aligned because that sort of environment and atmosphere is very, very healthy. Um, and so I would, I would hope that everyone gets to experience that at some point. Um, uh, that is my story. Uh, there is a whole bunch more I could share. If people have questions about financing, um, the lawsuit, uh, you know, some, some of the other places I slept, um, it really could be anything. I'm an open book. Um, and yeah, I'll, I'll open up the floor with that.
uh, we'll get going with some questions here. Um, so uh, what, uh, what advice would you give uh, to your younger self, uh, knowing what you know now compared to what you knew then? That one's actually quite easy. So um, whatever you're going to do, um, you have to be an expert in that element. We were going to be a technology company. We cannot outsource the technology development like we did. And that was hugely costly. I might own twice of what the twice the amount of building connected as I did at the end because of that one mistake. So if you want to be a technology company, you need to do technology. But I would also advocate that if it's not essential to your the success of your business, you should be outsourcing that. There's no reason you should be doing your own accounting or you should be your own tax person or whatever it is. Focus on what is successful for you and offload all those other things. And the more effectively you could do that, the better. One example I think people wait way too long to do, um, if you are, especially if you're in hyperscaling mode, right? Like we had months where we'd bring on 10 or 15 new people. We did that for multiple months in a row. Um, get an in-house recruiter. Uh, an in-house recruiter pays for itself if you're doing any sort of recruiting services. And if otherwise you're doing all the sourcing yourself, uh, which is extremely draining, time consuming. So if you can get an in-house recruiter, that that is awesome. I mean, by the end, we had five recruiters in our board. Wow. Okay, great. Let's see what else do we have here. So um, when an investor said yes, what did you attribute that to? I mean, you said you had pitched multiple times without success, and then finally someone said yes. What uh, what do you think was the game changer there for you? That one's easy as well. So when I pitched people and said no, I didn't believe in myself that we are worthy for venture capital. Once the thesis was proven correct, it's like my mindset changed and I pitched with confidence and, they, and anyone could see that. Look, there's someone to finance any deal if you can sell it. And I do believe sales is a skill. It's not... It, and there are people that are very, very good at it, and there are people who are terrible at it. And the difference between a great salesperson and a marginal salesperson is huge. At the end of the day, you're raising money, you're selling yourself and your business. So if you are very effective and can articulate the value and why you're the right person, you can raise money at any point in time. Great. Okay, so as a fellow uh, SCA alum, uh, could you share with us how the SCA helped your journey? Yeah. Um, so SEA, the craziest thing about SEA is my business plan was actually about building construction software, although I'd never been affiliated with construction at the time. And we won the best business plan. Uh, one of the uh, uh, ladies that was in my group, uh, Sarah Natividad, uh, she worked for auto construction and she was like, we need to bring cloud solutions to construction because everything was on prem. So uh, that actually was one of the things I think when I started looking and started being in Silicon Valley and, and understanding what our business plan actually said from a user experience, I think it helped me zone in on potential. I also think people mature um, with a, uh, at a different rate. Now, I, um, at that point in my life, was not ready to be a founder, wasn't ready for the responsibilities. Um, I was young, living in a fraternity house. However, <laughs> I did know that um, I wanted to be successful, and I got to see what successful people look like, how they operate, how they behave, their composure, how they talk. And uh, I learned a lot of that from Jim. He was one of the most impressive in individuals I had come across, which is why I stayed in contact with him. So I think it just laid the foundation of as I matured as a person, what my maturity and the person I wanted to grow into would look like. Great. Okay, everybody, keep those questions coming. Remember, you can add them in that Q&A box whenever you like, and we'll try to get to as many as possible. Um, okay, so who has influenced you the most on this uh, entrepreneurial journey? <sighs> well, or, I talked about Jim. Sorry. Yeah, I talked about Jim. I talked about... You know, Darren, um, uh, that one's not an easy one. 
Uh, I don't want to leave anyone out. Um, it's gonna it's gonna kind of sound silly, but like um, a lot of just people I don't know. I mean, I can't tell you how many inspirational YouTube clips I watch. Like like Arnold's speech, like, and just to stay motivated, it's, it's super inspiring. Um, there's, I'm trying to think of a specific person besides Jesse and, and Jim and, you know, there's a gentleman, Dave at Freestyle. And what I appreciate about Dave um, a lot was he came in and he joined our board and he basically never talked to us about the business. He was just focused on how I was doing mentally. And I didn't really understand why he spent so much time on that. I do now um, because running a company is extremely stressful. It, it can take a lot out of you and it, that materializes in a lot of different ways. And uh, he really made it clear, like, you can reach out to me about anything and any problems you're having. And it was, all, it was really nice to know that he provided that level of, of trust. Um, I mean, sometimes I question it because Dave always used to say, also, don't fuck up. But it was, he was great. <laughs> All right. Great. Okay. So, uh, oh, um, here's a question from one of our friends at the Academy from Ilya. What are some of your most oh. memorable moments during your time at the SCA? Uh, obviously you, Iliad. <laughs> we were, we were classmates <laughs> together. Um, I, I mean, I think, I think Mark Cuban's presentation was one of the, one of the mo most amazing things because he was diverse in a lot of different areas and it was, it was very impressive. You know, Mark at the time, uh, I would say it's questionable how he made his money in that, like, you know, he sold a company with very little revenues at a dot com price, but the guy's unbelievably intelligent. Um, I, I think this is more of a personal thing. Um, there was actually four of us living in our fraternity house that were all members. So we'd all drive together. We'd get breakfast together. Um, so like just doing all that, we'd study together and, uh, and very coincidentally, like, um, actually, my girlfriend at the time, she was texting me earlier, and I was like, I'm doing this. And she's like, oh, I remember you used to always leave me on Saturday mornings for this. So, <laughs> it's, it, at the end of the day, it's all about the connections you make and how deep those, in, those become and how strengthened they are. So I can't remember specific events, but I remember individuals, and, and those things, will, you'll never go away, so. Okay, great. So uh, Jim uh, just put his a uh, little bit of feedback in. He uh, asked, uh, would you share a little bit about uh, the extraordinary culture you have created at, uh, at your company? Yeah. Um, so we had a hiring policy. So, uh, and we kept it really simple and it was uh, no assholes allowed. So we were really, really good at not hiring assholes. Um, we, uh, this might piss some people off on this. Uh, we actually would not hire from Stanford or Harvard or any Ivy League schools because it really always wasn't a culture fit. It was never a culture fit. It took us until we were like at 150 people until we brought someone in. No, there was one guy from like Yale. And then there's until we got a Stanford person. It took a long time before we got a Stanford MBA. Uh, that, that, that's just co coincidental. Jesse and I both kind of had a chip on our shoulder about like Stanford people get to raise money because of their network, even though their businesses aren't any good. And, um, you know, we, we had to work a lot harder and at least in our eyes to do what was granted or given to a lot of people. Um, but the culture was, I mean, it was incredible. We worked really hard and we spent a lot of capital to make sure that the people knew we cared. So, I mean, we did all the typical things you would expect. There was food, there was catered lunches. Um, we would do retreats. Uh, we had pool tournaments. Um, 
we had Christmas parties. We did, did a lot of different things. Uh, I think that culture permeates from the founder and the founders. And, you know, I am probably more volatile and uh, erratic than my co-founder, but everyone knows that we care about their well beings quite a bit. And we show that every day when they have issues uh, and that creates a systemic culture. And so if you hire people that you think have good values, um, but as soon as you cross the line and don't, um, that becomes an issue. Uh, I, I don't know how I was able to do it. I got lucky, but I did something right. Um, my glass door rating up until recently, I don't know how it changed. It was a perfect score and I got, I got one, four out of five now. Oh, <laughs> It'll probably come back around. Don't worry. Uh, so we have a, a great question here from Maurice Thomas, who happens to be our curriculum committee head at SCA. And mm -hmm. he was asking, uh, what's the most underrated skill you suggest entrepreneurs have? Oh, I, I, I find um, I find that most entrepreneurs are uh, way too product oriented and lack the conviction or the confidence to go out and actually sell. And a lot of people want to do things that um, uh, they want to, they want to skip like the, uh, the, the tough work and go straight to scaling non-linearly. So I'll give an example that you see a lot of people spend a bunch of money on Google and Facebook ads. And it's like, well, you have, you've only sold five things. If you just went out and sold, three things, you just increase revenue 60%. Like you don't have to go to Google ads and Facebook, figure out the messaging, what works, feel out the customer, understand that. So um, I think in this day and age, a lot of people um, are lacking understanding sales, understanding go to market strategies. There's also, you know, how you build a business, how you structure a business. There's things like board meetings, there's, you know, how you realize revenue accounting, all, but the great thing is like all this stuff is super easy to learn. The, the last element, and this is super easy to learn, and this is one of the reasons I didn't raise capital, is you need to learn how to speak the language of investors. So especially if you're raising for technology, you need to know what CAC is or LTV. You need to know what reoccurring revenue is. You, know, you need to know what LTV to CAC ratio is. You need to know what sales efficiency is. Uh, you need to know what post money is. You need to know what anti dilution, what pro, pro rata means. But again, like all this stuff, it would take you, I don't know, a week to like ingrain in your head so that you can talk and sound like you're part of the, of the club. <laughs> okay, great. Uh, and we have a, a question from one of our fellows, uh, Jessica Douse. Uh, so um, if, we don't have enough time to hang out in coffee shops. Where do you think the best place to find potential investors is? Okay. Um, well, I mean, there's the obvious, the accelerators, but it depends on the type of capital you're looking for. And that depends on the type of business you're building, right? So first you have to identify, uh, what do I want this to business to be? What realistically can it be? What's the total addressable market? Who are the most likely minded investors for this type of business deal? So, um, and that's gonna, from there, once you understand your business and, and the types of capital that it'll attract, I think it's pretty easy to figure out where to go or how to meet them. So if you're gonna do a high tech, fast paced growing company, you'll probably look at some of the accelerators out there. Um, the Y Combinators, tech stars of the world. If you're going to do, you know, um, some some sort of like uh, development project, you could probably finance that with some angels and, and getting a relationship with a bank. Uh, so depending on the type of business, the growth, the the total adjustable market will will steer you in the right direction. Great, and then. Uh... Uh, Kristen, one of our attendees, has uh, any advice you have for getting over the fear of monetarily investing in your own idea, especially during an economic downturn? And how did you determine the level of personal investment that was worth the risk? Well, first, historically speaking, uh, an economic downturn is the best time to actually start a company. So if you're looking for opportunity, now is the time because more problems are being identified. People are, have more time to look for proactive solutions. We're eventually going to flood the market with a ridiculous amount of capital. So 
they're going to spend it on something. Um, now, how do you get over the risk? I think that that is, um, it's a very personal decision. Uh, you do so, and each person has a different risk threshold. Now, you cannot dump, you can't go so all in that every day you're a nervous wreck and you're worried about it because then you won't be effective. So, um, it's a personal decision that you have to get comfortable with. I think, and this is just in general, people um, think things are worse than they actually are. So, me, for example, I quit my job. I went really broke. What's the worst that really could have happened? I wasn't married. I didn't have a kid, so a child. Um, I go get a job. I mean, I live on someone's couch for a while while I get back on my feet. Like that, that for me wasn't that risky. So it was really easy to invest. At that time, my capital was simply my time. Um, as life gets more complicated, uh, you know, the, the risk does become higher. So uh, it's a personal decision, but I think people a lot of times, um, a lot of times uh, think the, the risk is, the negative outcome is uh, worse than it actually is. Okay, great. We have another question from one of our fellows this year, Jared. So, um, okay, you uh, successful acquisition of your company to Autodesk. So what motivates you now? That's a really good question. Uh, I mean, I'm trying to, I'm trying to figure out what's next for me. Um, I work for an amazing company, but as I mentioned, I, I think that my personality is better suited for something else. There's, and that that will materialize. I have uh, when you get acquired for that amount of money, you you have restrictions. Um, so I'm locked in. Um, let's just say hypothetically those are gone, and this is hypothetical. Everyone, um, those restrictions were removed. There's a few areas that I am particularly interested. Um, I think um, mental health in in um, in society needs to completely be reimagined. So, um, and I don't like how anyone's actually approaching it. I think that no one's approaching it by identifying the structural problem that exists. The structural problem that exists with mental health is there's only about 100,000 therapists in the United States, but we have about 70 million people or 100 million people that have some sort of uh, illness or mental sort of issue that could use treatment. Now, this sort of structural uh, um, uh, uh, imbalance is something that you need scalable technology solutions to help uh, cope with or help to treat. Um, and you, you need a lot of these technology solutions um, to lower the overall costs. Um, I'm looking at a lot of IoT things. Um, I think IoT, I think sensors are going to help us understand our environment and our place in society a lot better and more effectively. Um, so um, if you think about one of the things I'm looking at is indoor air quality. Um, if you think about carbon monoxide, greenhouse gases, how do we know the buildings are safe that we're going to? How can we understand how those airs are fluctuating? If As businesses reopen, we don't quite have the sensor technology to track viral loads. We can do some predictions based upon humidity and temperature, but the sensors will eventually get down. I think it's 2.5 microns to start detecting viruses. And right now they're at 30 microns. So uh, that's an area that I think is really cool. Um, I like anything that has to do with a network or marketplace element. So I think that there's going to be a lot of technologies that don't necessarily sell direct to a customer, but monetize creating a network that facilitates a more efficient marketplace, similar to Building Connected. Um, so if you think about what, uh, what PayPal does with Venmo, People don't understand how tremendously valuable just creating peer-to-peer -peer lending is because now money sits in here. Then they're going to monetize I mean, people's banks and checking accounts. So you start looking at things that offer network sort of marketplace solutions are always attractive. So I'll look at all those and figure out something fun in, in the hypothetical future. Very exciting. Uh, and then uh, 
if you're interested, uh, everyone, Christy has just uh, let us know there's a YouTube video out there. Out there, if we uh, we all want to revisit uh, Mark Cuban's showcase speech. And I have one more oh. question for you, Dustin. What was the first celebratory thing you did after your acquisition? <laughs> uh, who was it that, that you can share? <laughs> well, I mean, yeah, well, yeah, we had a. Someone bought me a three thousand dollar bottle of uh, uh, Kentucky bourbon, and so we were drinking that. It was it was me and Jesse and Rich, our head of sales and our VP of marketing, and Zach, and um, just sat around um, the office. Actually, Ben Anderson, who's a member here, he came and he came to our celebratory party. Um, one of my high school buddies came. It was more about just sitting down, like kicking your feet back and just like, wow, something that literally did not exist was created and we had an exit. It's it's a really like, I don't know, it's a surreal feeling. Um, and then you're like, I don't even know what to do now. Because like before he was so focused on like, goals and miles and it's like so it's just like let's just enjoy the moment so we, we just had some drinks and the second story at our office oh great all right well thank you very much dustin we really appreciate you telling your inspiring story um and it's especially uh heartwarming that you are an alum of the sea and that you were uh gener generous enough to come back and share your story with us uh, at this point, we are going to move on, and I'm going to hand it over to uh, Chris Chediak for the Wine Tribe message. Thank you, everyone. Thanks, Dustin. I'm really impressed by Dustin's success and entrepreneurial spirit. I'm also proud that SCA was part of his pathway to succeeding. I'm Chris Chediak, and I am a partner in the corporate group at the Wine Tribe Law Firm. Wine Tribe has been a sponsor of SCA for over 30 years. And we support SCA because of what you're hearing about today. SCA provides innovative entrepreneurs a fast track process to learn, to develop, and test innovative business ideas. Weintraub is dedicated to supporting entrepreneurship and innovation throughout the Sacramento region. SCA is a vital part of that, providing a non-traditional path for developing entrepreneurs in our region. And now I'm going to turn this over to Lori Dankin, board president of SCA. Hello everyone, it's exciting to be here today. Thank you all so much for being part of this groundbreaking SEA event. Over the past nine months on a daily basis, we've all had to learn to pivot quickly, be extremely agile, and most of all, be flexible as we learn to adapt to this new remote contactless lifestyle. It's been a challenging time for everyone. However, the entrepreneurial spirit that drives the SEA and the people like you here today have helped us overcome. Like true entrepreneurs, thought leaders, and design thinkers, we figured it out, and now we can thrive in even the most difficult times. The SEA class of 2020 is proof of that. We all came together to make lemonades out of lemons. With that, I'd like to acknowledge the class of 2020 for being highly adaptable and incredibly patient. I'd like to thank our mentors, board members, and presenters who didn't miss a beat when it came time to support our fellows. I'd like to thank our tech savvy, dedicated volunteers and our curriculum committee who laid the framework for a successful learning experience. And a big shout out to Christy Serrato, our program director. Thank you for steering the bus. Thank you for your commitment and your passion and your can do attitude. Thank you for being the glue that helps us all stick together. With that, I'd like to keep this event rolling. Next, we'd like to share a message from our, one of our hosting sponsors, Five Star Bank, followed by what you've all been waiting for, the SEA Class of 2020 Pitch Competition. Thank you. Hit it! That's what I'm talking about.
Hello, SEA community. I'm Christy Serrato. As a founding fellow of the Sacramento Entrepreneurship Academy, it is an honor to serve as the program director over the last four years. This year is especially notable. It has produced the most resilient SEA entrepreneurs ever, as demonstrated by the fellows who will be presenting today, John Goldberg of iSunscreen, Jessica Dows of The Looking Glass, and Brianna Mason of Runway Learning. Now, SA community, you have the honor to recognize one of these entrepreneurs. On the screen, you can see the polling slide. Here, you'll cast a vote for the 2020 Best in Showcase. Your selection guidance is as follows who best articulated the problem they're solving for their customer, as simple as possible, who explained what their product is and what makes it unique, who has the relevance experience to tackle the problem, who finished the pitch strongly with a call to action for the audience. Remember, you only get to vote once. These aspiring entrepreneurs and the rest of the 2020 class represent the future of SEA. I'm humbled to have supported their development and even more so to be called their fellow alumna. And now I present to you the 2020 fellows competing for our best in showcase. Thank you. We are creating a safe, effective, environmentally sun friendly sunscreen to prevent skin cancer by using nanoparticles to stop ultraviolet blocking chemicals from entering the bloodstream and harming marine life. I teach business management and the rest of our team members are students, faculty, and alumni of UC Davis. Hi, I'm Kaylee, and I think the key value that I bring to the team is my past experience in business development for two other startups, as well as a sales and marketing internship. My name is Kate Lugan, and I'll be working with UC Davis chemistry professor Mark Maskell to create our sunscreen product in the lab. Hi, I'm Deepak Vijay, and I worked in a lab last year where I learned to make and manipulate nanoparticles, which is the basis of our idea. Hi, I'm Mahima Fukula, and I have some experience in the semiconductor industry with nanoparticles, and then I use that to apply to a product management position at a startup, and I also work with another startup, so I have that amalgam of skills that I think I bring to the team. Wow, this pandemic sure has changed the way we live our daily lives. I don't know about you, but I sure do miss services I used to take for granted. The Looking Glass delivers the ultimate convenience, a mobile salon found throughout Sacramento offering busy professionals competitively priced precision haircuts with styling, hot towel shaves, waxing, and natural nails, allowing you to look and feel your best without sacrificing your free time. I have an important meeting this afternoon. I hope they don't notice my chipped nail polish. Oh, look, it's the looking glass. Now that my nails are done, I know everyone will listen to my words in this afternoon's Zoom meeting. Thank you, TLG, for conveniently giving me the confidence to be me. So now I ask you to join the looking glass team and help TLG disrupt the Sacramento salon industry by offering convenience and quality with every service every time. Instead of forcing students to suffer through subjects they don't like, presented in ways that don't make sense in their unique brains, we need to offer an option to pair their learning experience with activities and comprehensive resources catered to their needs, best suited to their most absorptive style of learning. Learning shouldn't be a chore or painful. It should be fun and interactive. It should highlight a student's natural talents, making them eager to learn more, building on their knowledge base in a cohesive way. That is where runway learning comes in. We offer alternatives for students, also aiming to be an ally and a resource for teachers. We already knew cracks in the education system existed. However, COVID has not only highlighted them, but added to them, made them a rift too wide to bridge without assistance. With Runway, there will be true solutions to this issue, not band-aids or patches on the issues that students of all ages face when learning, because it is catered to the individual child's strengths and specific learning styles. 
Learning and education is a cause near and dear to me. I have been an early educator and private instructor in Northern California for nearly 10 years. I've seen students flourish when they are given the appropriate tools, and I've seen them miserable and not appropriately encouraged as they should be. Run Relearning will take a holistic approach to give students the assistance they need with a fun, personal touch. slide up here uh, that will allow you to do that. Um, so there it is. So uh, you can only vote once. So pick that overall best pitch. And we'll be back in a very short while to let you know who the winner is. Thank you. And now I turn it over to our longtime board member, Chris Chediak of Weintraub Tobin. He will introduce our alumnus from the very first class I presided, the class of 2017. I look forward to reflecting on his journey since SEA and to take inspiration on how he is navigating during our new normal. I will come back later to share with you the polling result and present to you who is our 2020 Best in Showcase. Thank you. And now I'd like to introduce Ryan Sipkins. Ryan is the founder and CEO of Touch Shooting. He's also a 2017 fellow from, of the Sacramento Entrepreneurship Academy. Ryan took his passion and success on the basketball court and turned it into a thriving business, training and developing athletes. And now I'll turn it over to Ryan. Hi, my name is Ryan Sykins. I'm the founder of Touch Shooting Academy of Basketball, located right here in Sacramento, California. As a student athlete at University of California, Davis, I was able to break our all-time record for made three-pointers in our school, as well as in the entire Big West Conference, while leading the, the nation in three-point percentage. So as a basketball player, I was definitely known as a shooting expert, and I carry that expertise on as a basketball coach, mentor, and trainer here at Touch Shooting. Um, due to the COVID pandemic, we actually were forced to relocate our facility from the Natomas area all the way out here to Rancho Cordova. Uh, and this is where we're standing now. We currently train over 250 student athletes, ranging all the way from the ages of seven years old, all the way up to pro NBA professional basketball players. Um, so we have something for everybody. We would love to see you coming soon and get some work in. Hi, SCA community. I'm back to announce our 2020 pitch winner. I trust that each of you found inspiration uh, from our fellows featured during this showcase. Uh, let's applaud uh, the three fellows who pitched today. We are now at this exciting moment for which uh, we've been waiting uh, to announce our winner. Uh, so if we can, um, let's give a virtual drum roll and I'm very ecstatic to announce the winner of the Sacramento Entrepreneurship Academy Best in Showcase for 2020 is iSunscreen. Yay! Um, congratulations uh, to our 2020 fellow, uh, John Goldberg. And uh, you'll have an opportunity to talk to uh, his colleague, uh, Deepak, uh, representing iSunscreen. Uh, and also um, the other fellows um, who also pitched uh, to discuss their ventures uh, in our final segment of our showcase. I will now turn it over uh, to Anthony Garcia, who will tell us how to get into the virtual meeting rooms. All right, thank you, Christy, and congratulations to our winner, iSunscreen. Uh, I'm Anthony Garcia, Vice President of Merchant Services here at Five Star Bank and a 2020 SEA board member. We would like to commend all the fellows on completion of the program in such challenging circumstances. Great job to all the presenting teams today. Now for some virtual networking. As we've mentioned, we've uh, set up virtual networking rooms so that you can meet the SEA fellows and ask them about their ideas. There are three rooms, uh, one each for ice sunscreen, the looking glass, and SEA alumnus Ryan Sipkins of Touch Shooting. Unfortunately, due to a last minute uh, cancellation, there will not be a room for runway learning. Uh, the rooms are named for the teams in them, so you can join the rooms and conversations that interest you and feel free to move around. Uh, all three links will be placed here in the resource panel. 
uh, within the, uh, the platform for the presentation. We recommend that you leave this browser window open and return to click different link uh, when you want to move to another room. I hope you will take advantage of this opportunity and move around and talk to all the entrepreneurs and of course the other attendees. If you're interested in becoming a fellow or getting involved with the Sacramento Entrepreneurship Academy, please send us an email at sea at sealink.org and we'll get back to you. Thank you again to our sponsors, our presenting teams, and all the attendees, all of you, for joining us for SEA Showcase 2020, and we'll see you in the networking rooms.